It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker, Maria McGill. Uh, many people will, here will know Maria, uh, probably done and enjoyed working with Maria. Uh, she's worked in specialist palliative care in Scotland for 24 years. And um, she worked at Hunters Hill in Glasgow. Um, she was chief exec at the Highland Hospice for, for some time. She was chair of the SPPC and my boss for a while. And um, you may not know that last year she performed um, the Death Cabaret on the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, <laughs> since 2010, Maria has been chief exec of the Children's Hospice Association Scotland. And um, I've wanted for a while to, uh, to get Maria along to um, the SBC conference to share her personal reflections um, on what she has observed and learned, having made that transition from the adult world um, to the children's world. And uh, I was really delighted that uh, it's going to happen this year. And uh, I'll invite uh, Maria to come up whilst her choice of music plays. We're going to try and do Maria McGill in conversation for 20 minutes or so, uh, which I'm sure will be an interesting experience. So thank you very much, Maria, for um, agreeing to come along and do this. And um, I suppose just to start by asking you to, whether you can think back that six years now that you made that transition about some initial things that you noticed about the landscape and even just maybe starting with the, the people that you're, you're there to serve. Yeah. I think, first of all, I want to acknowledge that I am incredibly nervous about this this morning. Uh, these are very personal reflections, which is unusual uh, being on a stage. I don't have trusty PowerPoint. I don't have evidence to refer to other than what the past 24 years has meant to me and all the many things that I've learned, and indeed I learn every single day something about this amazing work that we're all involved in. And the other thing that's making me nervous is that there are many, many people in this room that I have worked with. <laughs> you all know the truth. <laughs> and you're also thinking, how is, she, how is he going to get her to shut up? <laughs> anyway, I suppose um, for me, one of the, the, there were many things that immediately I, I learned when I I had the great privilege of moving from, children, from adult palliative care into children's palliative care. And one of the things I learned is the incredible similarities, the many, many similarities that there are in the two specialisms. And one of them is the, the very beautiful ethos that we have of the person being the most important thing in everything that we do and of valuing, honouring and respecting every person that we meet and every interaction that we have and how important that is to the, to the work that we do. And I heard Erna, uh, Harold's daughter, talk about that last week at Parliament. She talked about being the intervention, so the individual, the practitioner, becomes the intervention rather than the task. Differences were very clearly, there are lots of little people about, uh, in a children's hospice and Pat, my esteemed medical director, was very quick to, to rem or not to remind me, to tell me, even though I've been a child myself, uh, that adults aren't big children, young people aren't young adults and children and babies aren't wee people either. Everybody's different and that's, that informs our work and our thinking. The other thing that was different is that we talk about children. We don't talk about patients. And I learned that very quickly because I was in the, the adult mode of talking about patients. And then I realised the conversations round about me were stunted, just were stunted. And I thought, what's wrong? Patients. So what do you call them? Children. Ah, that makes sense. But then you go into hospital and paediatrics and we go back to talking about patients. So it's, there are some curious differences and similarities. And a different mix of clinical diagnoses, I guess, as well. Absolutely. I would be, uh, I had to learn very quickly uh, about the different diagnoses. And Pat, again, my mentor at Children's Palliative Care, as you might imagine, said, actually, Maria, there are 365 diagnoses. Wow. So that was a big difference for me. And I would not claim to know 
every single one of them. Uh, I know the most common, perhaps. And coming from the world of adult palliative care, where predominantly it was a cancer diagnosis, although absolutely adult palliative care is much more than simply cancer, but in my time we were struggling to move beyond cancer diagnosis. But with children, in fact, looking at our referrals last year, 65% um, of our children had a non-cancer diagnosis. Uh, so we are seeing a shift because when I started with Chaz, it was predominantly non-cancer. And now we are seeing more children with cancer coming through. That's, that's a good thing. And what about families in children's <laughs> palliative care? What's the... Well, in adult palliative care, it, we were always conscious of the family and families were part of our discussions and they were always around. But children come with a family and necessarily so. Of course they do. And that's one of the great joys, I think, of working in a children's hospice. Because there are children, there are brothers and sisters, there are families, in whatever way that family comes. And sometimes it's mum and dad, and sometimes it's mum and gran or mum and sister. Sometimes it's uh, adoptive parents. Sometimes it's foster carers. And so there are many, many differences, and that brings a challenge, I think, Families are very young because their children are young and there are young families. And some of them are younger than 16. And that brings added complexities. These families find themselves thrown into unconventional parenthood uh, in a way that most had never anticipated. And so supporting and working with a family is incredibly important keeping families connected with their local support networks, whilst also helping them, perhaps role modeling parenthood for some families, and helping them adjust to, for many, the awful reality uh, of going through pregnancy and anticipating a, a beautiful, healthy baby and then that reality of something quite different. Uh, the resilience I've seen is remarkable, quite remarkable. But the importance of a family support team to enable that and to enable children to, or families to continue to be families and to have fun along the way. And is it a field where technology is pushing back the frontiers? Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, and that was another difference for me. Uh, coming into a setting where ventilation was common wasn't something I'd encountered in the adult palliative care world. And I know in the six years since I've left that you know, it does, that there are ventilators in adult palliative care. But you know, sometimes we have a, a ventilatory break where all the children in the hospice are ventilated. And that brings interesting challenges. Um, supporting children, because it is children, and it's about having fun. So a child says, I want to go skiing. And we've got a ventilator, and you think, OK, no, that's just not possible. Of course it is possible. And that's another uh, difference, maybe, is that what seems the impossible is Right, okay, how, just how do we make that happen? And it's made to happen. But yeah, technology is... Um, I, parental nutrition, I know that happens in, in adult palliative care as well. Combining adults, so combining um, ventilation, palliative, uh, parental nutrition, dialysis, the multiple comorbidities and complexities. Yeah. And that... Those domains of technology and complex family and children with, from a very young age, approaching adulthood with different capacities must come together sometimes mm -hmm. around very complex ethical situations. Yeah, you know that previous um, presentation, which was wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, the shared decision making is, comes alive in children. 
always having to be very mindful that the child is part of the decision making process and ensuring that as practitioners we find a way to enable the child's voice to be heard even in those most complicated decisions about life and death and so I'm in awe actually of our uh, clinical teams about their ability to do that and thinking about, you know, is there, is there more, more antibiotics? Are, are we going to have more antibiotics? Are we going to have IV antibiotics? Are we going into, back into intensive care? Or are we not? And the thoughts about what the child wants and eliciting that, and sometimes that's about Pat uh, or any of the other team, I've seen Pat actually on the floor in a child's bedroom going vroom, vroom, vroom. And not literally going vroom, vroom, vroom with the car and engaging in play and then going straight into it. Where would you like to die? But that's the matter of the conversation and that's how it can often start through play with very serious decisions. And families have their own, their own views. So mum might have their own view. And if mum's under 16, how is that complicated by mum's family? But all of that... These are all everyday occurrences in children's hospice world. And um, when we were chatting earlier, uh, thinking about how we might do this, you made a comment which actually remind, I was thinking about now, which is that you said in many ways death was less prevalent. Absolutely. And so if I think back to my days in Hunter's Hill, um, there was on average a death a day, every day. And so we were, in those days, very skilled at supporting uh, people who were dying and their families. Last year in Chaz, for example, we supported 72 children who died, and only a third of those were in the houses. Across Scotland, 195 children died who had palliative care needs. So the staff are less experienced in the art of caring for someone who is dying. And I think there's something there that perhaps we can learn more from, from our adult colleagues. And are the differences in terms of um, memory making yeah. and um, what, what, what you're hoping to achieve after a death has happened? Indeed. The Daleks are a bit of a tease uh, and a bit of a prop. So for an adult who is dying, there is a life that has been lived, however well or not that life has been lived. But for a child, life has perhaps, it's definitely shorter by definition. And so memories which are so important in bereavement in the world of adult palliative care, it's about perhaps gently revisiting memories, or perhaps not even gently at all, perhaps just plunging straight into revisiting memories, and it's a, an intentional and an easy process. But in the world of children's palliative care, we are intentionally creating memories every day. The families may not know that that's what we are doing, the children may not know what that's what we are doing, but that is absolutely what's happening, creating a legacy. And the Daleks emerged from... Uh, just one of those beautiful days I happened to be in Robin House and this uh, young lad, early teens, woke up in the morning huddle there was actually, he's, he's not that great, you know, of not wanting to talk, he's not terribly engaged and we don't really know what's going on. So one of the family support workers said, okay, I'll spend the day with Jimmy. And she went in and managed to uh, entice Jimmy uh, to talk and have some food. And he said, and what would you like to do? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Anyway, it emerged that Jimmy wanted to paint. And so that became the focus for the day because we then managed to entice him into a car to go down to Loman Shores and choose the canvas and the paints. And that's all of Jimmy's choices there. He spent six hours with the family worker on the floor painting. And it emerged he loved Doctor Who. We didn't know that. And he talked the whole time he painted, totally engrossed in his painting. He was exhausted and he went to bed and he got up and we had a house celebration and an unveiling. And this wee boy who did not want to talk or engage 
unveiled literally his painting. And his mum and his wee sister were there, and his wee sister said, Hey, Jimmy, you painted that. And it was quite delightful. And so we were then realised actually there's something in this, and it embarked, we then embarked on a whole exhibition that we were invited to take to Montreal to the Congress a couple of years ago. And so this painting has been to Montreal. And, when, and Jimmy died before we took it to Montreal. But his mum and wee sister were absolutely thrilled that we had it there. And I took some Vox Pops in the, my iPad and brought them back. And his mum and wee sister just loved the fact that Jimmy's painting lives on. And we all know about the Daleks and Davros and how they're different every season. And yeah, we learned a great deal from Jimmy. <laughs> So we're coming towards the end of our, our time, but uh, we're not over time yet, so we're doing quite well. <laughs> and um, how, I just, how long has children's palliative care been going as a thing? We are very young. Uh, so the modern palliative care movement, we would think about Sicily and St. Christopher's in 67. Uh, Helen House, the first children's hospice in the world, opened 30 years ago. Uh, more than that over 30, 34 years ago. So we are a young specialty, we are lower in profile, and so I do believe that we have a great deal to learn from our colleagues in the uh, adult palliative care, as well as I think we've got a few tricks to teach. But there's certainly a lot to be shared. Thank you. You've wanted me to prompt, so you're wanted, is there a key thing I've missed out here? No, no, we're fine. I was spot on time. I think we've done right, actually. <laughs> so we are approaching the end of time, and um, on your island, we're going to give you the complete works of Shakespeare <laughs> and a copy of the Bible, but I wondered if there was a book you'd like to take with you as well. Uh, yeah, there were two books, actually, when uh, Mark asked, and I wanted to, and they're both about love, and I just think that's absolutely core to who we are as people and what we do and the people that we serve. And so one is Winnie the Pooh, the complete works of Winnie the Pooh, and the other one is Anam Cara by Robert O'Donoghue, Celtic Spirituality. Um, um, you can take one luxury. And it has to be a bottle of Bollinger, anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, We've heard one of your records, but I wondered if there was another. We'll let yeah. you take two records to the island, and if there was another one you wanted to mention. Yeah, there is, and it's related very much to memories, volunteering, love, and absolutely demonstrates for me what we do. And it's called Herta from the Lost Songs of St Kilda. And if you haven't heard this album or seen, visited this website, which is just newly out, please, please do. It's a beautiful story of an elderly man who was in an Edinburgh care home and whose uh, piano teacher in the way back when, when he was a small boy, was the last living resident of St Kilda. And at the end of his lesson, he taught Trevor the songs on the piano that he'd learned as a child on St Kilda, the most beautiful, beautiful uh, tunes. They weren't, they were, and they were never played on the piano. There was never a piano in St Kilda. And so his volunteer, computer volunteer in this care home got talking to him and Trevor the old man said could, could we record these so volunteer went out to Mat uh, Maplin and bought a three pound mic and recorded these beautiful tunes that were are, you can hear for the first time uh, ever on this album and so the album has been produced by Decca, those original five songs are on that and five modern Scottish composers have, we're invited to reimagine those five tunes. And so Herta is my song, is my tune. Thank you very much. Thank you.